Hello, everyone. As Carrie said, my name is Jim Fitzpatrick. I'm the moderator for the Hemp Opportunities Investor Pitch Com uh, Competition. I would like to welcome everyone that has joined us today. I'm excited to be here on this webinar where we, we will have seven experienced investors who are judges and are joined by additional investors and sources of capital watching from around the world. We have eight companies that will present today to the judges, and they were selected from over 45 companies that applied. We have assembled a great cross-section of companies that will be presenting today. Let's start by going over today's schedule and the format for the investor pitch competition. The investor pitch competition will be approximately two hours long, and our goals are to entertain, educate, and connect companies from different industry sectors who are seeking additional growth capital and the hunt for new investors and sources of capital. Today, we'll hear from a lineup of eight innovative companies that will be presenting investment opportunities to a panel of experienced investor judges that are seeking investment opportunities. At the end of our webinar, we will learn which companies the investor judges like and if any are ready to invest. The schedule for today, today's webinar is as follows. Let's see, we are about six minutes off. So roughly for about uh, 20 minutes, we'll do introductions of the investor judges. Then we will have the company presentations and Q&A from the investor judges. Then roughly just after three o'clock, we'll have voting by the investor judges and you, the audience, will have the opportunity to vote for the company that gave the best presentation. We will announce the audience winner. The judges will each vote for one company and tell us why this is their choice. We will add up the judges' votes to come up with a total and the company that has the most individual judges will be the overall winner of the Hemp Opportunities Investor Pitch Competition. We will announce the investor judges and announce the winner. Uh, to close out the day, around about 3.15 or so, we're gonna get together. Uh, we'll be hosting a Zoom room networking where you can meet the presenting companies, investor judges, and meet the webinar audience. First, we have a few webinar items to cover. First, if you want to submit a question, just use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Please make sure you are all you are chatting with all panelists and attendees. After the final presentation, the webinar audience will be presented with a pop-up window on your computer where you'll be able to vote for your number one company presentation. The presenting companies will work to, and I will work to bring your questions from the audience. We will recommend that you monitor the chat, chat to answer any questions directed at you. That's for the presenters. As a reminder, you have access to the presenting companies and investor judges information at the contact information at the Cannabis Investing Forum. The website is www.cannabisinvestingforum.com. All right, so the format of investor pitch competition. We will be hearing a total of eight presentations today from presenting companies raising capital. Each company will receive 12 minutes to present and answer questions by the judges. I will introduce the investor judges first. I will introduce each presenting company. It's recommended that the companies do six minutes of presentations, which I'll give you a heads up at about five minutes and allow for six minutes of Q&A and then one minute of transition in between the presentation. The judges will raise their hand or can indicate that they want to ask a question. Judges are requested to have one question for each presentation and keep their answers to 90 seconds or less so we can have three or four investor judges asking questions of the, of the presenter. At the end of the eight presentations, the investor judges and audience will vote on the best presentations. Jim Fitz, that's me, will announce the winning presentation selected by the judges and the winning presentation selected by the audience. All right, here we go everybody, let's have some fun doing this. Our first investor judges is Chris Coulier, the head of beverage for the world famous Kaliba. Chris, are you with us? I'm here, Jim Fitz, how are you? Excellent, give it your best 90 seconds. You got it. 
Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Cuvillier, and I am the head of beverage and exec team member at Caliva. Um, I've done some angel investing. I've invested in some PE funds, and I've raised over $35 million in my career. So when Brad asked me to, be, uh, to become an investor judge, I got pretty excited to actually sit on the judge's side of the table. Um, I've also sold multiple businesses, including the sale of my beverage company, Zola, to Caliva, where I was the founder and the CEO. Um, have some experience on, on the institutional side as well. Um, we took on our first inv institutional investment from Immigrant Capital out of New York back in 2006. And we eventually sold Zola to a private equity firm called Carp Riley in 2016. Uh, post acquisition, I was retained as CEO and our focus was to drive growth by doubling down on our commitment to being 100% plant-based. Um, I'd been following the cannabis industry for five years at that time and strongly believed that cannabis and hemp were the ultimate plant-based ingredients, and we really felt that there was a great fit with beverage. So in 2008, I was speaking at a beverage conference in Las Vegas, was paired with Dennis O'Malley, who was the CEO of Caliva, and I spoke for 15 minutes about coconut water disrupting the sports drink category, and Dennis spoke about cannabis disrupting a whole bunch of different categories, such as alcohol and opioids, and really being a great plant-based solution for pain, sleep, and anxiety. So. Uh, Dennis and I quickly realized we shared similar visions for plant-based solutions. And after the, ev the event, he invited me to tour Caliva. I was highly impressed with the uh, vertical integration and the 110,000 square foot facility. Um, and I wound up investing in Caliva's A round uh, two weeks after that tour. Um, Dennis and I kept talking about beverages and the opportunity to drive growth infusing cannabis and hemp into beverages. Um, and that eventually led to Caliva acquiring Zola in April 2019 and me joining the Caliva team. Uh, today, Caliva is a leading consumer brand providing omnichannel access to a higher standard of plant-based solutions for health, happiness, and healing. And we are actively looking for investment and acquisition opportunities as we continue to grow and expand our business. So that's my quick background. Um, good luck to all the presenters. Looking forward to seeing the presentations. Well done, Chris. Very much appreciate that. Next up, Eric Spitz, the CEO of C4 Distro, located in Southern California. Eric. Hi, everybody. I am a serial entrepreneur. I am usually in the seat of the presenting company, uh, but I have had a fair amount of opportunity to uh, evaluate, be part of founding teams, not as an executive. Uh, my current primary role is as the CEO and founder of C4 Distro, which is a California-based distribution company focused largely on plant-touching uh, products that move through dispensaries in Northern California and Southern California. Started the business in 2016. Uh, we've launched approximately 25 brands into the marketplace. Uh, and we spend our time every day evaluating brands, evaluating opportunities to sell product to ultimately the cannabis consumer, who is also the hemp consumer. And this is a really interesting opportunity for me to see what's going on in the hemp market space and compare it to the opportunities in the, uh, in the cannabis market space. So I'm looking forward to seeing all the uh, presenting companies and hopefully I can be of, of some assistance in uh, helping to un, un, uh, cork what the key assets are in each business and, and how to make it move forward. Outstanding, Eric Spitz, CEO of C4 Distro. All right, I'm from Boston, so I'm just gonna apologize once for uh, butchering everybody's names. All right, Jay Cup. Howey is the co-founder and managing partner of Supercritical. Jay, why don't you tell everybody what your real name is and introduce yourself. Not too bad, Fitz. That was close. Jay Cowie. All right. Uh, and along with Carrie Jordan, formed two-thirds of Chicago-based Supercritical. Supercritical is a legal cannabis and hemp advisory and consult consulting firm. What we do essentially is work with our clients in helping to identify opportunities that they come to us looking for. We put particular emphasis on those companies and startups that look to solve the answers um, that cannabis and hemp sometimes bring, um, answers around sustainability, answers around about inclusion. Uh, we are very involved and engaged, especially at ground level in Chicago, having been recently named to the city of Chicago college system to help 
to community colleges in particular develop curriculum around certificate program as well as degree program, helping students come out of college with the acumen and the skills to enter into non-plan touching aspects of cannabis. So how that works at Supercritical is not only are we able to help guide those people of the future, they're going to really, really uh, drive this industry forward, but we are identifying for our clients those companies that are working on the answers, solving things like why bio waste should be used in al as an alternatives to plastics. Carrie touched about that earlier with truly green plastic. Are there other methodologies out there where we can extrapolate THC synthetically and do it in a prudent and moral manner and apply it as medicine? Because it is our firm belief that we have entered into a period in American culture where at some point we'll look back and ask ourselves, why did we have prohibition against this humble little plant? So we believe that we will never be given the opportunity to right those wrongs, participate in the growth of an industry where, where jobs will be created, and again, um, participate at every level along social equity. So that's a long way of saying we get truly involved uh, kind of at the bootstrap level with companies, as long as we can promote social equity, sustainability, and a sustainable future for the industry. Thank you, Jay. Next up, Jeffrey Finkel, CEO of ArcView Ventures. Jeffrey, everything we need to know about you in 90 seconds and encourage you to unmute yourself. All right, thank you, Fitz. I must say I'm a Boston boy myself. <clears throat> And while living there, knew a lot of guys named Fitzpatrick. Um, yes, I'm Jeff Finkel. I'm CEO of ArcView Ventures. ArcView Ventures is the principal investing arm of the ArcView Group. And I'm sure many of you on this panel and looking in today know of the ArcView Group. We're a little bit different than we probably were a number of years ago. We're now structured in four divisions. One is our traditional thought leadership group that produces informative webinars. In fact, we were just the co-host of Global Hemp Day uh, earlier in the month, which we did with um, ICANN in Israel. It was uh, well attended and uh, focused very much on the same subject matter that we're discussing today. Secondly, we have ArcView Capital, which is a FINRA licensed broker dealer, which we just launched. Um, we have a consulting group called ArcView Consulting, um, which is doing bespoke consulting assignments. And in ArcView Ventures, um, again, it's the principal investing arm. Presently, we're investing out of a fund with a fairly unique structure. It's called the ArcView Collective Fund. It is unique in that it is member managed. And what that means is our limited partners, which come from all of the domains around investing and around cannabis are part of the decision-making process on how the fund is run and in which companies the fund invests. We have 50 members, we've all pooled our capital and we, we provide really an institutional layer of support for individual angels that come together in a fund setting to avail themselves of best practices. We invest in 11 companies, I'd say our investing thesis, which skews seed and early stage, has not focused very much on the industrial side of the hemp story, a little bit more on the CBD and the extracts. Um, however, we are focusing more on that now. We've launched an internal initiative uh, to build um, you know, a, a grid of participating companies in each subsector that make up industrial hemp. So we're happy to be here today, and uh, we look forward to hearing the presenting companies. Thank you, Jeffrey. All right, as we move to John Nemanic, partner, Green Coast Capital. Great group so far. John, take it away. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful to be surrounded by such talented people. Really looking forward to hearing the presentations. Um, I was originally in investment banking, uh, then got, went, became an entrepreneur, had two nine-figure and one eight-figure exits in the technology sector. I uh, decided to enjoy my life. But approximately five years ago, I got involved with cannabis in part because of my wife's influence on me in that area. And I thought uh, I started investing. And um, without getting to a long story, I'm president of a company in Colombia in the cultivation space. I'm also the chairman of another company in Canada and I'm involved in a few other deals. Plus uh, Green Coast Capital is an amalgam of four family offices, including my own. 
and we've done 62 deals in the last two and a half years, uh, 16 of those in the cannabis space. So we're agnostic to space per se, but we do like cannabis. And that's it. Outstanding. Well done. Thank you for Thank giving you. us a couple of seconds back. We move on to Scott Griper. I knew Scott from the Wayback Machine when the rooms that we were on panels with were often uh, about the size of our panel plus a couple, Scott. So always good to see you. Uh, take it away. Who's Scott Griper? I'm more interested in who's Jim Fitzpatrick, by the way. That's more interesting than me. And <clears throat> I miss seeing you in your red plaid pajamas, Jim at the end of a long day at the show. So next time you got to show up in that outfit. Yeah. Uh, glad to be part of the panel, really strong group of people. <clears throat> I'm the founder and president of Viridian Capital Advisors. Uh, we were the first FINRA licensed investment bank in the legal cannabis industry when we launched in June of 2014. So we're celebrating our seventh year in this crazy but fascinating industry. I don't know the analog of dog years to cannabis years to human years, but quite a lot has changed in the last seven years. I've spent the last 20 years of my career advising, financing, buying, selling emerging growth companies in new vertical markets. It's one of the reasons we launched Viridian when we did. <clears throat> About, uh, what was it, uh, 18 years ago, uh, I similarly launched the first investment banking practice in a new vertical market in 2002. That was in Homeland and Cybersecurity. So about six months after the tragic day of 9-11, <clears throat> launched a practice that's similar to Viridian, was advising a lot of the new companies, the emerging companies in a new vertical. Um, so we've done, uh, our team has done about 600 million, $650 million of transactions, raising capital, debt and equity, principally acting as sell side advisor to clients that are looking to exit through a M&A uh, transaction. We also produce the Viridian Cannabis Deal Tracker, which is the most re robust database in the world that covers all of the capital markets transactions around the industry. Capital raises, debt equity, public, private, all sectors of the uh, country and world. And similarly, all the transactions around M&A. So uh, happy to be part of the panel and look forward to hearing from the companies. Thank you, Scott. As we transition to our last, but certainly not least, uh, investor judge, Timothy Lizot comes to us as CEO, Green Life Capital. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, fun fact uh, about myself, I'm a Marine, U.S. Marine veteran, and I actually just got a puppy, which is the Marine Corps mas do a mascot dog, an English bulldog. Um, so the fun fact, uh, my investment background comes from uh, investment fund management in real estate investment trusts, where I had eight separate accounts, where uh, just, just under a billion dollars in assets under management. Um, we also had a commingled uh, fund, which was uh, about $2 billion in assets under management. And that, that became today is now uh, collectively over $9 billion. Um, I left that field and uh, went into hospitality and had an exit, uh, built, uh, building a company from uh, the ground floor to exit. And my first uh, cannabis experience uh, joined a vertical in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada area. Um, and uh, took that and led the organizational turnaround of the company and uh, led that to a $70 million exit. Um, now with Green Life Capital, uh, we have a business development company fund uh, structure in the testing the waters phase. Uh, we're also a private advisor uh, to ultra high net worth individuals and family offices. Uh, we've been recently allocated uh, $500 million to loan. Um, we did work on with our team, we did uh, $120 million last year uh, in commercial real estate uh, and $43 million in um, working capital loans. We're also raising our next fund. It should be starting this December. And uh, most recently, last Friday, we hosted a similar event like this with our Linked Ventures, which helps take companies from zero to IPO. Uh, we had an event like this with 12 companies presenting and over 100 active investors that attended. And some of those companies are already in the process of uh, 
getting having some active uh, discussions with some of the investors uh, post uh, uh, over this weekend. We we're pretty busy with connect making those connections. But uh, that's that's it. I'm really looking forward to hearing from the companies today. Uh, very thank you, uh, Brad, for uh, allowing us to be here and and uh, looking forward to. I, this is just a excellent panel of judges here too. I'm I'm humbled to be amongst you guys. Excellent, Timothy. And thank you for your service. We now move to the presenting companies. As a reminder, each presenting companies will have 12 minutes. Round about the five minute mark, I'll indicate that you have one minute left for your six minute presentation. And then we'll move to six minutes of uh, questions from the judges. Our first presenting company is Alan Witters. Alan is the CEO of Gravitas Infinitum. Alan, take her away. Hi, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Um, for the investors out there, uh, there's one more thing that's a little more exciting than doing a startup. And that's doing a startup in a startup industry. We're talking about expon exponential risk, exponential rewards, and it really requires exponential planning. Gravitas Infinitum is an impact holding company. So we're focused on ESG and SDG principles. And we have two active projects right now, Gravitas Cannabis, which is a hemp biomaterials, which we're talking about today. And we just launched a T4L, a Transportation for Life, a, a Tesla auto subscription service. Uh, keep your arms and legs in the right at all time. Uh, we're gonna talk about plant one. This is a, a focus project in the hemp biomaterials area. This uh, has a multiple raises going on. Phase one, we're raising $12.5 million direct. This builds basically phase one of plant one. Uh, and I'll go into what plant one is in a second. We also have already started on phase two with castle placement on a $75 million round that actually modularly builds out our biomaterials plants. And then we've been working with Morgan Stanley, who's been vetting all of our numbers to actually roll these out into a, a multi-campus model. So what do we do? We do waste plastics to biomaterials. And you're going, wow, that's pretty cool. So the process is really simple. We take waste plastics, we do thermal mechanical conversions of it. We assemble what comes out of the waste plastics in that conversion process into light, water, minerals, and captured CO2. And again, we're, we're taking stuff that looks like this, really ugly things, and we then run it through what we call as the hemp bio machine. And we do this in what we call as a high density bio factory. And it comes out with all of these chemicals and materials. And we work at the nano level, the molecular level. We saw this industry and we analyzed and we said, you know, the whole industry pretty much is starting out in 1938. They're still talking decortication, they're talking oils, things that you can just take right off the top and it didn't really exploit the, the complete value of the hemp plant. And so when you look at our process, we actually go after about a thousand different marketable biomaterials. The way we're structured is we have three areas and eight zones. We take plastics waste in, we generate energy, CO2. And again, everything in, is focused on impact. In our bio density, uh, our bio factory area, we have a cloning, a growth area, and a finishing area. Our cloning, we have three types of cloning we do that will be standing up is typical stick cloning, that's conventional, and that helps us do propagation of species. We also are doing micropropagation that's fully automated. And we're also uh, in advanced stages of uh, somatic embryogenesis, which is basically synthetic seeds. And that helps uh, basically guarantee that you've got great bioproducts coming out. Our density biofactories are fully automated hydroponic growing systems that can take a small plant that's three or four inches tall and in 30 days grow it to a 10 pound plant. And this is not about making the prettiest Christmas trees or getting the best oils out. It's about producing the most amount of biomass across the whole plant as possible processing capabilities that are organic, that do not use any solvents, that do not use any temperature changes, and thus we produce and literally can produce about 600 different molecules 
400 different combinations and all 113 cannabinoids. So it's also about creating jobs. Everybody knows the job problem. And these are, these are our impact zones. 42% of every pound, every pound that we grow in these systems is a carbon capture credit. We also remediate a lot of water. So the biomaterials, you saw this earlier, we're focused on the building blocks and secondary chemicals. This is what we refine. And then downstream from us, companies would take those and turn them into bioplastics, biopapers, biofood products, all, all those types of things. The materials that we will be marketing next year after we build plant one basically are right here. And the right section is all the oils that are available out there. And this is gonna be of high interest to everybody in the CBD market because again, we expose 113 different cannabinoids. Um, our processing doesn't require any drying. We actually take the whole plant, the roots, the stalks, the flowers, we homogenize it, and we basically take it down to the molecular level right away. And from a processor perspective, we can go anywhere from 20 tons a day to 400 tons pretty easily. The plant one design is, if you walked into an Amazon facility and looked at the automation, it's really similar. We went to all the best and brightest warehouse automation guys and said, we want to do hydroponics in an automated fashion. We want to do cloning in an automated fashion. We want to do this also, it's basically a lights out operation. My, a lot of my team comes from lights out data centers, so we're used to this kind of environment. And this is what we have designed. Phase Alan, one. Well, Alan, this is Jim Fitzpatrick. Yeah. Um, I just want to let you know, your microphone is a little bit garbled. Okay. Um, so if you had it, that actually sounded a lot better. All right. Um, I, won't, I won't talk as loud then. Perfect. And yep. you are at the end of your six minutes. If you could just wrap it up, I'd appreciate it. Okay. We'll wrap it up right now. Um, this, this will actually produce 1.6 million, million pounds of biomass per uh, month. Um, the way to participate as an investor is either through the holding company level or through our project subsidiary level. Our financials just on the phase one, we try to drive 90% gross margins and 70-80% uh, net margins. In the business strategy, this is uh, an area that everybody wants to know, show me the money. And you know, this is where we've been working with off takers. Every one of our off takers we've worked with require more than the whole industry can actually produce a single one of them. And so we focused on the industrial scale of this. Excellent. Uh, Alan, you're, you're at seven minutes. I want to leave some time for the judges. Okay. Judges, uh, any questions for Alan? Alan, <clears throat> nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It certainly seems like you're addressing some of those issues I brought up earlier. Go back to that slide where there was area one Mm -hmm. and you're taking the plastics and now I give you that gallon milk chug and when you're done with that um, that part of the process there's nothing left of that plastic milk chug is that correct yeah and we take all types of plastic no matter what um, in Florida so, there was yep go ahead a hundred percent totally eliminated until which time you can source that back out to a plastic manufacturer who will then inject their new plastic molds or plastic material in into it to reuse it that way. So no, I guess my question is if it's waste plastic eliminated, is it 100% biodegradable at that point? Okay, so what we do is we pyrolyze the plastic, we turn it into oil, we turn that into energy, light, heat, and CO2 that we then feed the hemp plants. Ah. Got it, I didn't pick that up. And then the hemp plant, we actually uh, generate nanocellulosic crystals, which then can be turned into all kinds of plastics. And so we actually are supporting a full loop of guilt-free, a full cyclical loop for guilt-free plastics. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Judges, any, any other questions for Alan? Well, I would just, um, again, you didn't have enough time, Alan, so it was hard to get sort of a sense of the operating team that will spin out of hold code to run it, what their capabilities are. It's a $12.5 million raise. 
We don't understand really how much money has gone in so far, what the aspirational valuation is. So I think a lot of that is because you didn't have a lot of time, but why don't you maybe take a moment to address those? Yeah, so uh, there's been around $600,000 in cash put in uh, from our holding company to get it through the engineering phases. There's been an $8.3 million, $8 million intellectual property injection uh, from another outside company. And we're raising capital right now for plant one. Uh, plant one, $12 million uh, invested will generate around 25 to $27 million of revenue. And that's at a highly discounted wholesale value to the current market. Yeah, any comments about the team, like go to market team that's actually gonna take yeah, that out? A, we have about 10, 10 management uh, involved with this out of the holding company. Um, several of us have taken companies public. We're highly diversified. We've done, uh, as a team, we've probably done three to $5 billion worth of fundraisings and deals, 20, $30 million, billion in contracts. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Any other judges have a question? We've got about a minute and a half. Yeah, hi, Alan. This is, uh, this is Chris Cuvillier. Um, wh where does the plastic come from that, that you were using in this process? It seems like there's obviously a huge issue with plastic in the environment, and there's companies like 40 Ocean that are, that are mining the ocean for plastics. So just curious if there's a good, really good sustainability uh, uh, opportunity here. Yeah, there is. Um, we've been working with a local uh, recycling uh, waste pickup companies in the, and the uh, cities and state. In Florida, where I'm located, there were 540,000 tons of plastic picked up two years ago. They only recycled Alan, 45 your mic tons. They only recycled 45 tons. And so 91% of waste plastic goes into landfills. They're now going to start being penalized for that. And that's what we will be picking up and converting. Got it, thank you. Excellent. Uh, Alan, remind, rem, uh, as a reminder, check the chat room. Someone would like to get in, in contact with you. Wonderful job. Thank you, Alan, really appreciate it. Uh, judges, thank you for your questions. We're gonna to transition to our next presenter. Uh, we welcome Barry Perkins, the CEO of VEED, with a V, V-E-E-D. Alan, take her away. Hi. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. <clears throat> I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce Veed. Um, Veed is a tech-enabled PE structure for brands. Underneath there, we have Veed. But within Veed, it's a te or we're facilitating $300 million of qualifying transactions in 24 months through a media-driven, community-powered market network. If we look at where we go from a goal and end perspective and work backward, I find that the most valuable way to actually drive something. We're planning already and working with uh, people in Canada to drive a, a, a SPAC or a CPC up there with leveraging qualifying transactions from 300 million of the $1 billion total G annual GMV selected across 30 plus profitable companies, including 100 plus high growth brands, AI, FinTech, SA uh, and software as a service in Canada and US, all in the cannabis space. To get there in 2021, we're gonna raise $5 million, which we're gonna to use to drive the growth of the business and attain and attain $1 billion of uh, total GMV across the brands. Right now, where we are, we're, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's a $2 million raise to launch the actual commerce facilitator function of VEED and drive the cannabis market. And we're, our, our goal with that is to actually drive $100 million of GMV across the brands that we work with. To date, we have $500,000 in from founders and friends. The current market that's out there for cannabis is inefficient and incomplete. It's a two-sided market, which is basically buyer to seller. 
There's no B2B marketplace. It's difficult to find and connect with business partners, and it results in a high cost of doing business. As well, there's no real integration into the social networks, and it limits the capacity of businesses to drive growth. What were the big change of what we are doing is we are a commerce facilitator. If you want to read about a commerce facilitator, check out the link below. <clears throat> anyway, in this one, we are connecting all different members in the cannabis market space in an end or end sided multi dimensional marketplace where everybody sees everybody works with everybody partners with everybody and connecting that via social networks and leveraging a social the networking effect to drive incremental sales and growth cultivate trust and build relationships across customers Veed itself actually benefits because we drive non-linear cash flows, which are composed of pure profit. One of the key foundations for what we're doing is that you have to know the customers that you have, and you have to know their path to conversion. And in this particular space, the current space, people have attribution where they click at the last just to close. If you look at the typical uh, affiliate marketing structures, they don't know the journey along the way. And people spend vast sums of money in upfront uh, advertising and marketing costs with very, very slim returns because it's all based upon prepay. And we go beyond that last touch attribution to actually track every step along the buyer's journey. And from there, we can actually pay people along the way for the influence that they provide at, by leveraging their, net, their writing, their um, social networks, and so forth. And this is the structure of some of the fees, and you can see how we get paid on the bottom. This is all based upon the fact that the buyer's journey, people are leveraging social media to determine and their social channels and their friends and families to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, what is going on in the market, what they should buy, what's interesting. In here, there's some interesting statistics. As you can see, 92% of the people trust recommendations from in individuals about a product, even when they don't know that individual. That's kind of an interesting number, a little bit surprising perhaps. Well, after discovering a product through social media recommendations, 55% of people buy that product online. That's the choice Sorry, pattern. That's, okay, that's the pattern, choice pattern that's going on out there. So the goal is to turn customers into co-sellers. You want people who know and use and love the product to write about, talk about, post about, and share information about the product. And to do that, we actually pay them along the way as co-sellers. To expand that, we work with media companies to drive access to vast numbers of audiences so brands get more visibility and <clears throat> driving new customers, new co-sellers, and an efficient way to drive incremental sales growth through additional advertising. These are the companies that we are launching with currently right now. We have others in line as well. This, as you can see, is a very Thank significant- you Barry, could you wrap it up? Yep, okay. So we're targeting at this point, it'll be a hundred million dollars of facilitated revenue, which delivers 100 or 11 million of net revenue. This is the team that we have that's through here. We have a lot of expertise. And in the, currently what we're looking for is to raise $2 million right now, which is going to be to take us through our launch and actually drive the onboarding of 100 plus brands, media companies, retailers, et cetera, and, to, and work with $100 million of GMV across the brands. Excellent, Barry. Thank you very much. Eric Spitz is one of our judges. Eric, did you have a question? And you're likely on mute. I do have a question. Thank you, uh, Jim. I wonder, uh, could you uh, help us understand, I'm in the cannabis distribution business, so a lot of those charts make a lot of sense to me, but I, I'm, I'm trying to understand who you are cutting out of the business or what, you pl what role you play in a current business. Are you looking 
uh, to disintermediate the distributor or the, the ultimate consumer? And how do you turn an ultimate consumer into a, a, a seller, if I'm understanding it correctly? Okay, so thanks. Good question, Eric. Thank you very much. So first of all, we're not trying to disintermediate anybody. We're connecting with the distributors, the manufacturers, the brands, the licensed retailers, and the cultivators not to actually move the product around. We facilitate the commerce. We connect the money from one to another and allow a, a very efficient buying mechanism for each of them. More importantly though, we tie them to the vast number of people in the market that want to buy the product and we leverage the, the e-commerce systems and the distribution or the, the dispensaries for them to buy it by driving awareness to particular brands and products. People can click and have a quick, easy uh, path to buying what they like. Okay, so that I feel like I heard that the first time around, but I'm still yep. a little fuzzy. Could you walk us through a transaction? Yeah. Okay, so if um, some, uh, here, let me go through this one. <clears throat> it's, uh, I gotta put this, if you look in here on the top right hand corner, uh, I've gotta get this out of the way, there we go. When, that, when somebody wants to post about a product, right? They post some information on any of the social networks that are out there. It could be a review or it could be on a blog or whatever. And in there, somebody will read about a product. They decide that they like the product. It's, 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 use for example, Cheech's Chicha, stash. Somebody writes about it and they see that link and they say, this is a, I'm really interested in that product. They go, they click on that product, it takes them to our marketplace. That then they look at how, what the details are of the product. They find out that maybe it's on uh, an e-com, maybe it's delivered by our heart chain. They click it, they buy, it gets delivered through the dispensary of their choice, wherever they're at legally. They get the product, they decide they love the product, they write about it, decide they want to become a co-seller. In there, when they buy, there's an opportunity for them to say, hey, do you wanna be a co-seller? Because if you write about and talk about the product and somebody clicks and pay gets uh, and actually buys, you get paid along the way. And then our customers become co-sellers in a virtual circle. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have two minutes if any judge has a final question. I do. Sounds John. like you're trying to harness network effects and second order effects. And the way I Correct. look at it is an inter, it's an interactive ecosystem. So my question to you is what will initiate the virtuous effects? How will you get something like that done? Like, for example, I'm a cone seller. What's my real incentive? I, I write some material praising the product and from there, how am I compensated? So when somebody sees your product, let's say you write an article and you post it on High Times, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't even have to be an ad. It's an article talking about something else and you mention a product in there. Somebody clicks on that link, says, hey, this product looks interesting or they click to your article, which actually attracted them to the first place. We store that attribution, that link that's embedded in there that says, hey, he actually influenced the use for the, the interest in this product. That, at that point, when somebody goes along and has an, they might want to buy it right, there, right then, but most people don't buy on the first opportunity. But eventually when somebody buys, if you were the intro, you'll get the intro fee because we recorded when you actually introduced that person to that product, where, when, how, and why, right? The next part is that you might actually, if in your article, have the link to the product. Somebody clicks on it and says, hey, I want to buy it. We record that right at that time and you get paid at that point for influencing the actual close of the product. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. I, there's a lot more I could ask you, but that's certainly a good start. Oh, yeah. I'm so, presuming you're using an underlying blockchain technology to store the data. We have a we have a very significant underlying technology. It's a little difficult in the short term to right. describe it. It's based. It's called Awake or Shop Type by Awake Market. It's part of the Awake structure that I'm involved in. I would okay. love to get on the phone with anybody, and we can walk through all of the details underneath this. Okay. And we can actually demo it because all of this is up and running right now. Okay. Excellent. Barry, you might want to go and visit the chat and introduce your contact information. Thank okay. you very much for your presentation. Well done.
Thank you. Okay, now we're moving over to Charles Wu, who is the CEO of Fino.ag. Charles Wu, the stage is yours. Great, uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you five by five. Wonderful, well, hey, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm really excited to be here. But first, I would like to ask uh, the audience a question. And the question I'm gonna ask is, have you ever wondered why, you know, farmers out uh, there are paying up to a dollar per seed for high quality hemp genetics? Seems crazy. Now, um, would you really be interested in technology that can produce these same seeds for under 20 cents each? And that's literally what we've come up with. Uh, Pheno.ag is an offering that we call uh, genetics as a service or giving you gas. And what genetics as a service is, is it's a pay as you grow service that produces feminized hemp, either CBD or CBG seeds, starting at around 20 cents a seed. And where did this come about? Well, it came about because we've been in the industry for quite some time. Uh, we're an education and engineering company. Uh, we've provided a lot of education out there for uh, cannabis growing, and we've designed all sorts of engineering systems. And what we found is there's a massive gap between, okay, now I, I've learned how to grow, I've learned how to grow commercial cultivation, and now I wanna go produce my flower, and I need five million bucks or 10 million bucks to even get started on that front. So what gas is, or genetics as a service, is that is an interim step for a new CBD brand, a new hemp company to uh, get into the market without having to invest lots and lots of money into infrastructure. Similar to how you know, Amazon Web Services or the data center business lets you get into the computer business without having to build your own data center. Now a little bit about us, uh, our team. Uh, my name's Charles. I'm a 20 year technology uh, entrepreneur. Uh, I've had two Inc. 5000 companies. Just uh, cut my teeth in the wireless telecommunications space, uh, building towers and working with uh, the REITs. And then I got into the, uh, the co-location and data center space. Uh, our COO, uh, Matt Pottery, he's a 30 year veteran uh, of the technology and telecommunications uh, field. He used to run uh, 13 states for CenturyLink. And then we have our lead grower, who's uh, Matt Wachowiak, who has over 20 years of uh, cannabis cultivation experience. And what's nice about us is uh, we actually have traction. So uh, last year, uh, through the training and consulting business in terms of how we came up with this concept, we did about uh, close to a million bucks in revenue. And you can see on our uh, tax return, we did about almost $400,000 in taxable income. Uh, in 2020, we launched uh, this gas initiative and we're at about uh, $90,000 right now, uh, year to date on our pilot. So let's talk a little bit more about, you know, what gas is and what can it get you. So everyone, you know, says, oh, I can grow one plant, but truly growing consistent plants at scale is really difficult. And what we do is we offer it uh, essentially as a service on a perlite basis. So if you want to produce seeds, it's basically 700 bucks a month uh, per light. Uh, we also include mother, clone, star, tissue culture, and or veg case. And based on a 60 day flower pollination cycle, we're able to put out about 7,000 seeds uh, per 60 day harvest. So it comes out to about 20 cents a seed. Our operating expenditures, we're running at around 250 bucks a month uh, to support that. Most recently, uh, we've had people approach us and we've got uh, customers signed up to produce high quality uh, indoor CBD flour. So on the flower pricing, because there's less infrastructure involved, specifically, we don't have to worry about pollination and all that uh, comes into consideration, we charge less. So flower pricing is 500 bucks a month uh, per flower. We're averaging about a pound and a half of uh, trimmed flour, uh, which comes out to about 670 bucks a pound per flower. And our cost comes out to about 200 bucks a month uh, on an operational perspective. You know, uh, breaking down when we do the uh, seed side of things, we always include field testing. So we have a 40 acre uh, farm uh, in Illinois where whenever we produce seeds for people, we plant them to make sure that, you know, they're happy with the seeds that they get and we can help them with their SOPs and their planting guidelines and everything on that. 
Uh, moving on, what have we gotten so far and what have we done with our 90K? Uh, starting last year, we built out a little pilot site. So it's around 2,000 square feet. Uh, we allocated originally a lot of the space uh, for seed, but then as we learned more, we allocated space for flowers. So in that 2,000 square feet, we've got about six to 700 square feet of uh, light canopy uh, covering that space. Um, our a five minute mark, 60, 60 seconds left. Okay, I'll be quick. Our CapEx is about 400 bucks. Our flower space CapEx is 250. We're 100% leased right now. Uh, here are unit economics. Uh, we kind of talked about that. I'm just gonna go quick. What's our ask? Uh, right now we have uh, secured a new 18,000 square foot facility uh, for expansion. We're gonna allocate around of that around 3,000 square feet initially for flower and 3,000 square feet uh, for seed. And we're looking for about a million uh, for uh, internal build out so we can build out our space. Uh, finally, uh, so to summarize, we're looking for about a million bucks. Uh, what we're offering in addition to that is the founder myself will match uh, all investment dollars on a one to three basis. And finally, we're in an opportunity zone. So for people who understand that or have major capital gains, uh, investing us in us lets you defer the capital gains and uh, you have some nice upside potential or tax-free potential in the future. That's that. A kudos to you for putting out your tax returns. I'd like to see everyone now. Yeah, very creative. <laughs> yeah, that, that was very, very good. Hey, do you um, guarantee my genetics throughout the entire process? How do you avoid against any um, cross contaminations? Well, in terms of the actual seed production chambers, um, they are sealed. Um, they have HEPA filters, and then we use a variety of air handling technologies. Uh, that are ozone based and infrared based to basically kill things uh, outside. Um, for pollination, um, we obviously will pollinate inside the area. And ultimately from the genetic side, assuming we get genetics from uh, the customer, I mean, we also have some genetics, but in many cases, the customer is giving us their genetics uh, to do this. Now we do have one customer where we did, you know, a genetics lease. So they have to pay a royalty fee to a seed, co a seed company. So they pay our you know, I mean, think of us, we're like the co-location space, we're the data center, we're the rack, you know, and the remote hands to run it. And now the genetics might be your software application or your IP. So there's an, a, an IP fee on top if they don't have genetics. Now, the other thing that's interesting is for a lot of, with how the farm bill works, if you're a farmer producing for yourself, you don't, assuming you haven't signed a material transfer agreement that limits you, there are, the seed patents don't cover self-production right now for hemp. So literally a farmer, you know, we've got one person who's basically they bought some seeds from somewhere, they grew some plants, and then we're taking some cuttings and starting a cycle for them uh, based on what they bought. And that basically, if he grows for himself, it's fine. He can't resale those sorts of seeds. Thank you. Hey, very nice. Um, I, I have a question. My, um, one of my clients and, or portfolio companies is actually one of the largest uh, producers of, of genetics in, in the hemp seed uh, business uh, throughout, the, throughout the U.S. And so I was kind of curious um, where, I, I don't know if I caught this, where were you located and how were you going to use the money? So we're in Chicago, uh, a suburb of Chicago. Um, we are going to use the money for internal build out of the building. So we've acquired the building and effectively with COVID and stuff with the training business is what it is. I can't access uh, loan monies for the inside. So that's what we're doing on that side uh, from that perspective. And we would be interested in talking to your portfolio company because one of basically we have some people that have genetics, but we have a lot of people that don't have genetics and they mm. say, oh, do you have a genetics partner um, that yeah. can provide for that? Yeah, I'd love to be able to connect you. One of the things I was curious about also is just as far as your customer acquisition, what's your go-to-market strategy for your customer acquisition in finding customers who want to be in this um, shared or rack space type of, uh, I, I think it's a really cool concept. I like that too. But I wanted to know how are, how are you going about, you know, what type of, a customer are you trying to target and how do you plan on doing that? 
So uh, we have a training business and our training business basically teaches you how to cultivate uh, indoors, whether it's uh, hemp CBD or other sorts of indoor flower. And before we were doing that, you know, what happens is if you, it's similar to Cisco, right? You go to Cisco school and now you graduate from Cisco or Microsoft and then you go buy Cisco products. So we were doing the training and then uh, a lot of our business traditionally has come from then doing engineering or referring them over to product manufacturers that say, okay, now you've learned what it takes to grow indoors and these are the lights you need, blah, 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 blah. And effectively, this was just a big gap we were running into and more so on the CBD side than the THC side, just because uh, we operate in what's called limited license states, right? So if you got a license and you're one of 50, you know, you can raise money. But for the CBD guy that learns and now they want to grow indoors, they're like, well, I don't have half a million bucks or a million bucks to kind of just get the thing up and running. And you can put the money in, but you still have to learn how to grow and run things properly. So we've got a pretty good training business. Uh, we're in the process of relaunching that. That's historically brought us, you know, plenty of customers. We also have some uh, fairly solid partnerships um, on the training side. One of our biggest partnerships right now is a platform called Tillable. They're, think of them like the Airbnb of farmland. And it was like former Monsanto Climate Corp guys. And they've got about, for the Midwest, 12,000 farmers and a little over half a million acres uh, on their thing. So, you know, we've been doing some hemp stuff with them too. Hey, Very cool. hey Charles, mm -hmm. thank, thank you for being well explained. Um, and the value proposition is clear. I was wondering if you just maybe spend a minute, I'm not sure how much time we have, giving me a little bit better sense of how you're able to achieve 20 cents instead of a dollar. Um, and if that process is patented. 30 seconds, Charles, if you could. <laughs> yeah. I mean, from 20 cents versus a dollar, keep in mind, a dollar is a sell price. So usually today what's going on is most companies out there are vertically integrated seed companies where the average cost of seed production is somewhere on the low end from 15 to about 35 cents. And then they sell on the market anywhere from 50 cents to a buck. So what we're doing in terms of the process, what we've done differently is we are offering it on a co-location model. And then we have a cool concept uh, called remote hands. And I'll just show you this screen share real quick. Let me just share my screen here, where we have actually outfitted our uh, technicians with head cams. So, you know, here's a picture of one of our guys, you know, looking at stuff. You can see there's a little camera can you guys see my screen okay or can you see the picture? I can if you could figure uh, finish up Charles we'd appreciate it. Yeah okay you can see the camera and then they literally get to like imagine looking through a zoom meeting but someone's kind of working on your plants and they offer that remote hands so. Outstanding Charles well done greatly appreciated and I would encourage you to check the chat room there is uh, somebody there that says they would like to cut you a check. Oh even better. <laughs> Yeah, thank even you. better. Thank you All right. Thank you, Charles. Okay. Next up, Coleman Beal is the CEO of Bascor. Bascor is a company I am familiar with, and I'm fascinated to hear the story. Coleman Beal, take it away. Great. Great. Thank you. And excited to be here. Um, let me... So uh, my name is Coleman Beal, and I am the CEO of Bascor. We are an industrial hemp processing company. Uh, we were established in 2014, and today, we are one of, if not the longest, uh, continuously operating industrial hemp fiber uh, processing company in the United States. And so our mission is to uh, process hemp for quality products, a better world, and a sustainable planet. And we do that by focusing solely on the stalks of the plant. And the two products that we produce are fiber and wood. And our vision is to be the leader of hemp innovation for a bio-based future. And we plan to be the leader uh, both domestically and globally. So the, the number one challenge right now facing the industrial hemp space um, as it relates to fiber and herd processing is just simply a lack of demand for processors. It is the number one pain point, it is the choke point of industry and our technology, our business model and partnerships are our solution to the problem. And so we see um, exponential growth in this industry you can see a chart here over the last four years of the growth in acreage and industrial hemp in the United States, and that is um, overwhelmingly CBD related. So with the interest shifting towards fiber, which we're seeing uh, more and more every day, we think that this is only going to expand. Hey, so, Tom, we can't see your presentation. So if you're 
you might want to screen share. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Looking good though, man, looking good. Teamwork here, teamwork, loving it. All right, can you see, uh, let's see. All right, is that better? Yes. All right, do you all want me to start over or just keep going? I, I would keep like. going. Okay. Um, so this is our technology. Our, um, our technology is the, uh, the solution to the problem. Uh, we have two patents pending. All of our uh, processes is uh, designed and built in-house. Um, and then what really makes us unique is that we are able to have a uh, high quality material um, and produce it uh, very efficiently. And so all of our, um, all of our products are grown here in the United States domestically, processed here domestically, and our customers are domestic as well. So it really isolates, insulates us from any type of international uh, disruptions. Um, so our materials, the fiber and the wood are really, we think of them as, as really inputs or ingredients to a whole host of products. There's 20,000 plus different products that can be made out of industrial hemp. Um, here's a list of just, just a few ranging from diapers, apparel, fiberglass, insulation, and so forth. So we get asked all the time, well, well why hemp? Um, why, you know, what, what, what makes hemp so great? So, so really, I mean, we work with it every day. Um, it's a, a, a super strong fiber. It's mold resistant, antimicrobial, renewable, sustainable, and it's got a high moisture regain, meaning, it's, uh, meaning it absorbs and, and, and dries out very, very easily. So uh, because we've been in the industry now for uh, going on six years, we've uh, been fortunate to really build out a robust pipeline of customers. And these range from large multi-billion dollar uh, corporations all the way down to kind of smaller artisan customer as well. Uh, we also have a research and development arm. Um, and the, the, the focus there is really on the wood. So effectively, we take the wood, we micronize it down into a powder. Um, you can see the powder there in the second picture on the screen. And then on the far right is, uh, these are actually fibers that we produce in a lab uh, that you can see under a microscope. And so, so really the longer term vision there is uh, to have a substitute for oil-based products, which solves an e tackles an even greater problem in the world. And that's really to start um, putting products in the markets that are, that are not dependent on petroleum-based products. So we're in the process of finalizing our commercialization effort. Um, we're, we're located in Montgomery, Alabama, in a 60, uh, 61,000 square foot facility that's, that is located in an opportunity zone. Um, and we plan to have uh, our operations commencing next month. So this is our financial model. We believe our model is highly scalable and that we can replicate our systems very, very cost efficiently. This is our team here. Um, we're, we're, I feel really, really fortunate that we have a team with um, a lot of different types of industry experience. And so it brings a whole lot of different ideas and uh, expertise to the table. And that certainly contributed to our, um, to our advancement over the years. So currently we're seeking two and a half million dollars. Pl we plan to use the funds for working capital, supply, CapEx, and hiring of new personnel. So really Bascor, we, we do have a first mover advantage in this marketplace. Uh, we have a blue ocean opportunity. We really don't see anybody standing next to us right now. Um, and then, you know, we also uh, think it's important that we're going to have an economic impact on our, the local communities that we serve. So, so really, really in conclusion, we, we have the supply, we have the technology and the processing, we have the pipeline of customers. And so now what we really need to really in, energize and, and grow the business is capital. So, so with that, Thank you for your time, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Roman, well done. Just under the six-minute mark, which leaves us plenty of time for our judges. Scott Kreiper, I bet you have an intuitive question for this fine gentleman. How intuitive of you know, to know that I have a question, Jim. It's outstanding. Um, Coleman, thank you for that. <clears throat> You've been around since 14. You're only raising a couple of million bucks. What's been happening for the last six, seven years? I mean, it's really been um, really an evolution. I think that when we started the company, the primary focus on hemp was, was CBD related. Um, the fiber market, I would say, has been overlooked. Um, and that interest, really, we started to see a shift, I would say, in the last 12 months or so. I, I would have expected in December of 18, after the farm bill, that it would have accelerated, but really a lot of the attention 
continue to stay and grow on CBD. So, so now we're seeing a lot more interest, a lot more acceleration in the marketplace, but it's allowed us to really, um, to really refine our processes, refine our technology, because the fiber, some of the things that make it so great are some of the things that make it really difficult to work with as well. And so, um, I mean, really the last uh, six years have been just, just taking the company from inception and just been really being in, a, um, in an R&D mode and just, just one, one day at a time, one step at a time, scaling our efforts. So you've been focused as a processor for the hemp-derived CBD brand marketplace? And so now, the industrial side is so, that so we've only so um we don't we we've only processed since inception of the company fiber um or our focus has been on the stalks of the plant so really um handling material in the early days we were handling more grain specific crops because that's really all we had access to um, we began to get access to um to fiber specific crops about three years ago we actually grew in conjunction with the farm um, a fiber crop that went pretty well. And so we've taken that knowledge and we've applied it to several other farms that we're, we're currently now working with. So now we're starting to see a really, really good quality fibers coming, um, being grown and coming to us. And this has been just, just an iteration over the last several years. Have you generated any revenues through processing to date? Uh, today, a little, but not, but not much. I mean, we've um, we've under about a year and a half ago, uh, we 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 made a strategic decision to to move into out of what I would call an R and D facility into a larger into the the building that we're currently in now. And so, we're just now getting to the point where we're putting the finishing touches on that. So I would I would anticipate us scaling our revenues here over the next two to three months. Okay, just one last question. <clears throat> so you're raising two. How much has been invested in the company to date? Today, we have approximately uh, $2.7 million invested in the company. And where did that come from? Uh, we have a variety of investors. I think we have, I believe it's 13 investors on the cap table right now. And how much capital do you have invested in the business? Uh, personally, uh, yes. ju just under 200,000. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Any other judges have a question? Coleman, I have a question as we wait for another judge. You're on the bleeding edge of these things in the industrial side of industrial hemp. Where do you see the best market in the future? Is it the RV folks of the world integrating it? Is it the home builders? Is it Patagonia? Where's the growth going to come from? Oh, that's a great question. Um, a tough one to answer because we're, we're, we're getting inbound inquiries from a variety of different industries that all represent massive growth potential. So our focus is really from the inception then on the apparel and the textile business. Um, and so, you know, that's where, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of demand, a lot of interest there. Um, but certainly when you look at non-wovens, I mean, there is, there is a lot of potential um, for, I mean, I mean, products that, you know, that I listed on the presentation, like diapers and things like that, and things of that nature. So um, I think that there is, there is a lot of, um, of opportunity for, um, for industrial hemp in the United States to, to go into a lot of different product types. Outstanding. Judges, any questions? Uh, Coleman, Coleman, you have your hand in the air. There you go. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Coleman, are you working with any material science, scientists? Because I think there's applications that have been really grossly overlooked, in particular in the nanoparticle sphere and developing filters. And I do believe that there'll be disintermediation on a global basis, so there'll be a need to bring some of this back to the US. Um, have you thought about that? Have you looked at uh, bringing in a different, a uh, couple of experts to help you to assess potential market opportunities? Sure, no, that's a great question. Um, so yes, our research and development arm, we have, um, we have two green chemists um, on the team. It's part of our, our we have a joint venture established with, uh, with, uh, with the green chemist and, and an engineer as well. And that, that's the focus of that joint venture. So we have, um, we have done a lot of work in, in that space. And I, and I agree with you. I think um, the tech, you know, we've developed the technology um, to, to start really looking at those markets on a lab scale. But I mean, admittedly, it's a little bit further out, but I think that the, the, the material applications are, 
are very exciting and, and very, very interesting. Thank you. Yep. Coleman, 30 seconds left. Anything else we, you would like us to know about you? Um, well, again, I mean, I, I obviously, I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I think that from bass course standpoint, we are is better, we're more well positioned than we ever have been. We're seeing way more inbound interest um, as it relates to fiber and her than we ever have been. And, and, I, and, I, and I truly believe that, you know, we are at the, the cutting edge, um, not only from a technology standpoint, but the timing in the industry. Uh, we've watched the, the industry unfold now over the last six years, and it's, it's, it's been a long time coming, but I feel like the, the, time, the timing is finally there. So I think this is, this, this is the time to go. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us today and a wonderful presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next up, Davina Kwani, CEO of Element Apothic. Hi. Davina? I give you a mouthful, right? <laughs> Feel free to introduce yourself and correct me. The floor is yours. Hi. I'm Davina Kawanohi, the CEO of Element Apothic. I'm happy to be here today. I hope that uh, you all are having a great day. I've really uh, enjoyed the presentation so far and feel fortunate to be with such an incredible group of people. So Element Apothic is a new clean and luxurious CBD brand redefining the body care and wellness industry, positioned to be a market leader by meeting the needs of today's conscious consumer. As you can see, my story started a long time ago with a plant. I grew up seeing so many people benefit from cannabis. My dad was a Vietnam veteran and would often tell me that without cannabis, he wouldn't be able to make it through the day. He couldn't sleep. He wouldn't be able to walk outside of his door. And I recall a seminar, I was sitting in school and they said, if anyone's family, parents do drugs, raise your hand. If they smoke marijuana, raise your hand. And I, I went home and we talked about it extensively. And I always wondered when it was going to change, when people would realize the actual benefits of the plant. So I'm really excited many years later after exiting through corporate America to be starting a company in this space. Element Apothic was born in a kitchen, not a lab. When our co-founder, who was my great aunt, suffered from several medical, medical conditions and autoimmune diseases, she created products that could help her. She realized that the toxins and preservatives and many of the products were causing her medical conditions to worse. She created over 40 custom formulations. Today, now with medical oversight, we are bringing those formulations to the market. The problem today is that consumers don't know who or what to trust. CBD holds a lot of promise, but most brands don't live up to it. Personal care products are filled with toxins and harmful ingredients. There's over 1,400 toxic ingredients that are allowed in products in the United States that are banned in Canada and Europe. So you can see we have a problem. There are low quality products flooding the market with little to no transparency. Many products have no medical oversight and there's often an absence of ingenuity or product variation with so many white labeled products in this space. The solution is Element Apothic. We have created 100% clean and safe products with medical oversight, we have transparency and are committed to sustainability. Our never ever promise means that we will never ever use any toxic or harmful ingredients in any of the products we create. And we are leading the market utilizing not just CBD, but utilizing the benefits of other minor, minor cannabinoids such as CBG and CBN. And we'll continue to add more to our products as there's more research available on these additional cannabinoids. We also have a big commitment to education through our blog and Dr. Swathi and I, who's our chief science officer, recently started a show on Razzle Cannabis Network that's called the science behind the plant to really educate consumers about things like their endocannabinoid system and what does homeostasis mean. By educating people, we're able to level up the market and bring it to everyday consumers. We have created a really impressive team that has over 60 years of relevant experience and have an impressive medical advisory board, including, as I mentioned, Dr. Swathi, our chief science officer, who is actually releasing a educational series for pharmacists to introduce cannabis into traditional pharmacology and serves as an adjunct professor at several universities. And Dr. Marvin Singh, who is the director of integrative medicine at UC Irvine. And how do we stock up? 
stack up against other brands, we feel that we hold a really incredible value proposition against many of the brands in this space. And as you all know, the market opportunity is huge, but what's unique about our products is that not only do we touch the hemp base and cannabis market, but we also are able to reach the wellness market and the beauty market as well. There are over 240 million new consumers that are coming to the market, and we have an opportunity to have an impact on these consumers. And our financials, although are aggressive, we feel they're very reachable with our plans that we have in place for our omni-channel sales approach and marketing campaigns. To date, we are ready to launch with five products. Our online product sales begin next month, and we've already in, in, in incorporated several wholesale commitments, including showcased by Cal Ethos. We have a few online marketplaces. Several practitioners as well have signed up to work with us. We have received Cert Clean certification and Leaping Bunny certifications so that we're also walking the talk. We're putting our words and our efforts where we communicate with our consumers. We've established key partnerships, including Tag One for transparency, so that consumers can see exactly where their products come from, exactly what part of the world that those ingredients are sourced from. Davina, we're at uh, five minutes, 60 seconds left. Okay, great, thank you. And our omni-channel sales approach will allow us to be able to reach several consumers. We have an aggressive influencer marketing campaign and additional traditional marketing channels that we'll use. Our customer wants to take care of themselves. They want a brand they can trust. We are currently raising $500,000 through a convertible note. And you may be asking yourself, why invest in Element Apothic? It's trust, plain and simple. Invest now and join us on our journey to set a new standard of clean science. Element Apothic, never ever anything but good. I'm done. <laughs> Davina, uh, well done. Are you in Orange County? I'm in Los Angeles. Los Angeles, excellent. Judges, who has a fantastic question? I think all the judges have had an opportunity to speak. So if uh, someone has a, a question here, come on in. In the Hi, meantime- this is, uh, this is Chris over at Cleva. Um, nice Chris presentation, really like the branding. Um, and uh, your, your presentation was, was really clean and, and super easy to understand. Um, there's a lot of uh, hemp CBD beauty products coming into market. Um, do you see, what, what do you see as your main point of difference um, in, in terms of product or, or brand? Is it, is it really based around trust? Um, or are there any other things that uh, on, on top of that that you think might give you a competitive advantage in a pretty crowded space? Yeah, I understand the market is really competitive. I do think trust is something that is going to really be a unique offering for us and really um, focused on the transparency and showing all of the ingredients and holding true to um, exactly the products that we have. Um, but in addition to that, I think the educational component behind it is something that a lot of brands are lacking. And I think that that's something that in consumers are really needing so that we can you know, bring CBD products to the mainstream consumer. Got it. And, and, and what kind of margins do you see in beauty products like this? Yeah, I mean, the, the margins are pretty incredible. Our margins currently, depending if it's wholesale, are in the 50 to 60% range. Um, direct to consumer are in the 70 to 80% range. And that's what's incredible about that is that we're also utilizing some of these other minor cannabinoids that obviously have a higher cost value, but all of the ingredients that we're using are organic and EcoSir and, and many of our products, for example, our lotion or balm have 15 plus um, ingredients. And some of those oils are pretty expensive, but we feel the value of those are really important. And even adding all those ingredients, we're still able to keep those margins where they're at. Awesome. Yeah, that'll go, go well towards building trust. Thank you. Thanks. Davina, those are great margins uh, on the wholesale 50 to 60. Um, in, in this space, I think if, if you're going to price yourself at 70 to 80 percent direct to consumer, you're going to compete with your wholesalers. Um, so you're, you're going to want to probably um, just you're going to probably want to raise those margins up um, your direct to consumer because you got to give your 
um, your wholesaler, your distributor, you've got to give them room to make profit too. And you're kind of not, not uh, allowing them enough room. But I, I, along the same questions, um, as far as b besides trust or education, um, talk about your traction that you've had with your um, wholesale commitments. Um, what's the what's the order that they've put in? Have they what's the minimum order requirement? Um, are they putting in a reorder? Um, tell us more about that traction so far. Yeah, so we're just actually launching our products for sale next month. Um, we do have some commitments already, though, um, and I can go in detail about those. Our minimum order is 500 units. Um, we do have some, um, we're actually in conversations with a, a GPO medical practitioner network that um, it, we're probably finalizing that this week. Um, that's a pretty significant order. I can't go into details about that. Um, and some of the other online marketplaces, some of them are more of the drop ship type arrangement. Um, we do have a subscription box that's going to be ordering a thousand units. Um, we'll be launching that at the end of October with them and in conversations with another subscription box that's much more significant than that. Um, and then a couple of the retailers around that 500 mark per order um, to initially start with. Excellent. Thank you. Judges, any questions? We've got two minutes left. I have a quick one. What's the, the one thing that keeps you up late at night or the one thing that you really have to execute in this crowded field? What would that be? It's really to, to bring brand awareness to why and how we're different. That's the thing that keeps me up awake because we are going into a crowded market and there's a lot of companies that are saying similar things that they have organic and clean products and, and they're the best. But I think when I've looked at those products and I really evaluated what they're offering, I do feel that we have a competitive advantage in terms of um, the products. We're not just taking a lotion or a balm and adding CBD to it, but we're really looking at every ingredient that can actually add value. And many of these products were created without CBD and they work. They worked for countless people for many years. And so now we've enhanced those um, products by what we're doing. And so the the biggest thing is how can we get people to know about us? And that is going to come through marketing, messaging, influencers, you know, continuing with the education, the show that we're doing um, to show people who we are and that we're actually someone that is a brand that they can trust and that's going to create products that really help them. And the 500,000 that you're raising, could you quickly run us through the use of proceeds? Yeah, so the 500000 that we're using, a majority of that is going towards marketing. We've already invested our own money to um, pay for the products and to bring them to where we're at at this point. Um, the additional part of that will be continue for research and development, and then to continue to bring on additional um, consultants and build our team um, to be able to scale. Obviously, we're not going to be able to do all that with 500000 but a majority of that is going to be going towards marketing expenses. Excellent. Well done. I encourage you to check the chat room. It looks like you brought a, a, a bunch of raving fans over there that are uh, in full support of what you're doing. Great. Thank you very much. Bye, Davina. Next up, uh, Jeff Allman, CEO at good for Jeff, welcome to the party. Hi, thank you. So let me uh, um, start this for you. Okay, uh, everybody can see it? Yes, we're good, Jeff. Great, okay. So uh, this will tell you a great deal about us in one, one minute. One question everyone wants to know about hemp. We've all heard what hemp can do, but what can hemp do for you? So let's get a little personal. What would you do if your favorite person had metastatic cancer and was given just six months to live. My favorite person is my wife, Cindy, and there was no way I was going to let her suffer. Well, our son is a pharmacologist and offered to help me put together a team of doctors to relieve her pain while not interfering with her cancer treatment. Our team developed two breakthrough pain-killing products, which helped to relieve pain in just a second. Friends heard the good news and asked for something for their pain. So we gave away samples and confirmed it was good for everyone, which is why we started a company and named it Good For. Hi, I'm Cindy Allman. Years later, I'm very alive. I used to have a friend of and now I can live with it. Hi, I'm Jeff Allman. We created our products to be 
be good for our family. And now we know they'll be good for your family too. Okay, so that's an important thing about how we operate. But now, now let me show you uh, what's really important. Oops, that's not the right one. Here we go. Oops. Don't mean to be eating into my own time, but we'll see. You all can see that? Okay. I don't think so, Jeff, Boy. unless it's coming up. Okay, here we go. Uh, sorry about that. Oh boy, that's... Multiple. All right. You can see this on the screen? Not yet, Jeff. Okay. Uh, well, I probably could use some help then. Ah, uh, ah, uh, wait a minute. Here we go. We're good. Yep, I see that here. Okay, this is our team. Um, we've grown quickly and uh, here are the brains of, of our bunch. Not shown here is our board of advisors that's comparable to a Fortune uh, 100 companies. Uh, we own uh, the best brand name in the entire consumer goods category, at least that's in our opinion to produce pain products which give such effective and inexpensive and instant relief that the company gives customers a double your money back guarantee if it's not good for you. We thrive in an industry that's very cluttered. Good or bad, pain is a very good business to be in. You know, no pain, no gain. Um, what else can be said other than if there's a better brand name in the entire consumer industry, not just hemp or CBD, I'll guarantee you'll never forget our name. We use, everybody uses good for in language every day. Our competitive advantages are very good for good for and all of our investors. And you can read them for yourself. You'll all get a copy of this so you can take your time and go through it and be as uh, critical, skeptical, analytical as you'd like. Trademarks, we have multiple trademarks in the United States and uh, quite a few other countries. So we're covered there. Here are some of the products that we're selling right now. We're essentially a pain company. And when you have pain, you need to attack it both topically, externally, and internally through oil. All of our oils are USDA certified organic, and we think that's, it costs us more, but believe it or not, we charge less for our products. Here are other products that are coming out uh, in the first quarter of next year. The formulations have been done. Everything else is really done, ready to uh, produce them. Uh, and as you can see for yourself, uh, there's many products, uh, good for stress, good for sleep, even good for sex. My point is we can place almost any consumer product or service or service with good for before it and customers will know exactly what's good for them. It cuts through competitive clutter. Our business model, we're right now 100% direct to consumer. Customers buy directly from our website, goodfor.us. But soon you'll see us everywhere. Uh, marketing channel. Pardon? 60 seconds. Okay. Um, the, you can see that. Here's the very important revenue sources. You can see that family and friends and uh, word of mouth accounts for over 40%, reorders 32%. So you can see that we've only spent 3,500 or less than $3,000 in advertising. So wait until we start advertising. Pro, um, this, is, uh, this is, I guess, the money shot where you want to see. And uh, again, I'll make this available to everybody. Term sheet, convertible promissory notes, minimum $50,000 investment. We're raising $750,000. Use of funds, here it is. And uh, scaling beyond hemp. We're much more than just CBD. We believe good for is the diamond in the weeds 
good for investors. And shelf attraction matters. This is just one SKU. We have many more available right now. Our design and our name breaks through the clutter. Thank you very much. And uh, now I'm open for all questions. Excellent, Jeff. Well done. I'm not sure if any other judges had the benefit of receiving a sample from Jeff, but judges, what questions you might you have for Jeff? Hey, hey Jeff, this is Chris Couvillier. Um, interesting brand name. Um, I, I think it does a nice job communicating what the product's good for, which in a category like hemp CBD is, is not always clear on packaging. Um, also like the idea of attacking it topically and internally. I've, I've never really heard that before. Um, I, I guess a couple questions for you. One is um, what are the margins? Uh, and, and two would be what, what is your go-to-market strategy? Well, we're in the market already. We're online. We're not in any stores. We're going to concentrate on uh, online sales, direct to consumer and through wholesale. Uh, we also have a very, very active ambassador or influencer program. Uh, which we, we pay nothing up front. We only pay a commission afterwards so that we can expand. Uh, all of our systems are in place right now. Uh, our, uh, our profit is um, embarrassingly high. Um, even though we charge, and you can check, much less retail, direct to consumer than any company I know of. And we provide USDA certified. So what you swallow is what I give to my wife with, who's got a, you know, a death disease. So we don't screw around. We treat your family and you like we treat us and our family. So it's over 85%. It would be, again, higher than that if we charge the going rate that everybody's out there. So we're looking for market share, not more dollars per product. Got it. So, so you're saying you're, you have over 85% gross margins on the product? Yes. Well, I, I, I wouldn't be embarrassed when, about that when you're talking to investors. Yeah. I, I don't like, uh, I don't like to brag. Um, keep it pretty straight and simple. Although I do love my wife and my family and I'll brag all day about them. <laughs> so Jeff, for that product line, you have um, more than a handful of different topicals out there going off the way the massage oil, the sex lube, or whatever it is in sunscreen. Was that the original concept to come out with a full product line or did that grow based on ambassador feedback or how did you get to that point? I hate to see my wife suffer from a, a her death due date, meaning her prognosis was between Halloween and Thanksgiving 2016. The powerful toxic chemo drug that she was taking caused her all kinds of inflammation and pain. So we, I asked her what she wanted us to do. She said, kill, kill the fucking cancer. Um, well, we couldn't do that. So we make no claims about cancer. We talk about, we make claims, specific claims about pain. So we created that and that's what we have. And this is our fourth iteration. Uh, good for pain in two different SKUs. Um, one is a, uh, t you know, um, boy, you can't even see it. Okay. One is a uh, airless pump, again, contaminant free. That's why we spent the extra money on the, uh, on the container. And the other is the same gel in a box. So you can, you know, if you're a runner or you go to the gym or you're a golfer or tennis, you can just put this in your shoe, whatnot. And this would cover a, uh, I'm 6'2". It would cover both sides of my leg, one leg for, all around to give you a sense. So it's, it's, keeps disappearing on the green screen. So it's there. We have many other topicals, but we're essentially a pain killing company. No pain, no gain. Uh, Thank you. So Jeff, bu building, on Chris's, building on Chris's question about margin. So how do you have an 85% gross margin? Are you selling higher? Are you sourcing cheaper? Are you buying volume? How are you achieving, let's say an out of market margin? On the core product. It is out of market, isn't it? Well, first of all, as the people saw on the texting back and forth with panelists and presenters, we pay only $400 per kilogram per kilo, uh, kilo and that's uh, 68 point something percent CBD, 74.2 percent, I think, um, 
total, cannabinoid, total cannabinoids, and that is for full spectrum. Our oils, meaning what you take in a tincture, uh, those are USDA uh, organic. Top, there is no research uh, that's credible. In fact, I don't, we don't see any research, and we scour, that shows whether uh, USDA certified organic is any more or less effective, but it is five times more money. So we buy inexpensive, our vendors are very close, we control our, our uh, supply chain, we can grow as fast as we want. We have an extra $100,000 that my wife uh, has permitted, I guess. I have to be her love slave even longer. Uh, <laughs> if we if we're between, you know, sometimes a big order can put you out of business. Yeah. So we're not going to go to the big CVSs, Walgreens, et sure. cetera. We're going to grow this way fast. Uh, we believe we'll be very attractive for an exit plan because you could put good for in front of almost anything, including accounting services, including traveling, and anything you want, good for. And we own trademarks all over the place. We spend a lot of money on and for your convertible note, is there a conversion cap? 15 seconds, please. Yeah. Um, yes, there, there is. And I'll send you any information you want. Uh, it's a $50,000 minimum buy-in. or We're raising $750,000. Um, and uh, it's 36-month period. If we um, have another investment of $1 million or more, then it's an automatic push, an automatic conversion to equity. And just lastly, does Cindy have a hook shot? I saw she's got a... She's got a she's wiggle your house, tushy. But she have a she's got a wiggle your tushy shot. It's very <laughs> distracting. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, another fine presentation. It looks like Jeff, if you check the chat room, you brought another fan club. Well done. Thank we you. We move on to our second to last presenter. Justin Monger is CEO of Locked Brands. Justin, welcome to the pitch. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. I will tell you, I dry ran this, and I, it came out at six minutes and 15 seconds. So Go I'm for it. Best, I'm going to do my best to keep, keep it right there. OK, let me fire this up. Hi, I'm Justin Monger. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lock Brands. We're the developers of the Stash Can. We take smart technology, integrate it with modern design to produce cutting edge personal lockbox systems. And right now we have a regulation crowdfund running on WeFunder as well as a, uh, a sidecar Reg D for accredited investors. Now there's an old adage that I heard in college and I hear it even today. It's your stash and you wanna keep it that way. And that's why we developed the world's most advanced personal lockbox system for cannabis and pharmaceuticals. And when I say pharmaceuticals, I mean also uh, cannabis derived pharmaceuticals, not just cannabis products, okay? Uh, so what I want to do now is jump right into a quick video to give you an idea of what the stash can is. Let's face it, smoking weed has changed. Like, no one even calls it weed anymore. It's cannabis. And now, it's being legalized throughout the U.S. and all over the world. It's time to declare weed all grown up. Shouldn't the way you store your weed, I mean cannabis, grow up too? Introducing Stash Can. You can unlock your stash can in one of two ways. First, it will only open up with your voice and your voice only. The second method to open the stash can is with the free iOS Android app. Whether standing right next to it or opening the stash can while you're on vacation on the other side of the world, you can share access with a friend through the app. Here are some fun facts about the stash can. It stands at four inches by six inches and is powered by a standard five volt micro USB charger. It has a built-in battery with a life of up to six hours. An RGB light ring that lets you control the color and pattern and can remember up to five networks. Voice activated, app control, 100% 420 friendly. I mean, 100% cannabis friendly. Stash can, the smart way to stash your stash. All right, uh, so what we've done here is taken a single technology and used it to tackle two seemingly disparate problems. The first problem, of course, is just keeping your stash secure. Uh, that's the stash can. It's app controlled, it's voice activated, it's smell proof, it's airtight, it's a personal lockbox. It also features access sharing as well as logging. So you know anytime it's been opened, who opened it and when they opened it. Now there's a second problem out there and that's where our, our Gen 2 device comes in. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up a second. We launched the stash can this last February. 
right about two weeks before the pandemic. Not exactly what you call the best timing. But in that time, during the pandemic, we now have 60 authorized retail shops online in the US, Canada, and Mexico, uh, brick and mortar stores carrying our, our stash cans. So we're pretty happy with that. That's considered, all things considered with the pandemic. Now for the, our Gen 2 device, we're uh, tackling the problem that's associated with opioids and prescription drug abuse, in particular, the Secure Med Manager. It's in development now and we have a prototype. What we did was we changed the form factor expanded the same underlying technology that's there in the stash can and did it in a way so you can not only secure your possessions, in this case pharmaceuticals, but it can also help you manage them. So it's very, very handy for addressing the opioid and prescription drug abuse problem in this country. And let me just play one more video for you, get you an idea about this. Have you or a loved one been impacted by the opioid and prescription drug abuse problem in this country? Would you like to help save lives by preventing addiction in the first place? The Secure Med Manager from Lock Brands tackles the addiction problem head on. It is a secure portable device that ensures only the patient gets the meds. It guarantees the meds are only available per the doctor's prescription. And it generates a compliance record and stores it in the cloud. It is always connected to the cloud and if tampered with or broken into, shuts down and notifies the healthcare team. Now for a lab demonstration of the SMM prototype. The pill pack is being automatically fed into the compartment. When complete and at the appropriate dispensing time per the doctor's prescription, the compartment can be opened when the button is pressed by the patient with the matching fingerprint. At Lock Brands, we're dedicated to saving lives by preventing addiction in the first place. Okay, so there you have the two fundamental products, the single technology that we're applying to these two problems. So now the important thing is who's behind it to make this happen. We've got a great idea. Who's, who's there to make it happen? Well, my investors and advisors and my board, I want to talk about some of these guys who are so critical to our success. Number one is Dr. Narmi. He's an emergency room doctor. He's an entrepreneur. He's an investor, very early on investor in the company. He's also an opioid addiction expert. Then there's Jeff Mahoney, a self-made man, built his own company as the chief architect and CEO of SaveDaily.com. That is a $300 million a year company now that Jeff has somebody else running while he handles multiple other companies. Then I have Brian Waters also on my board. He's a, he's a bank CEO that is brought, brought in when banks, uh, banks have a problem. He comes in, fixes a bank, gets it back on its feet, and goes off to the next bank to fix. Then I've got Brian Greer. He's an investor both in the seed and the angel round. He's a former president of Honeywell Asia. He retired last June and has been really involved in helping us figure out how to get out of China, get our manufacturing out of China. Then we have Brian Esposito. He's the founder and CEO of Intellectual Enterprises, Esposito Intellectual Enterprises, and he is our enterprise-wide- Five-minute warning. Okay. Then I've got uh, Dave Plissold, who is a, a lawyer, and he is our FDA compliance. He's at a company in Washington, D.C. that specializes in risk assessment for the FDA. Uh, so, so now the question is, why invest in lock brands? The, the responsible storage aspect is not going away. That problem is just getting bigger and bigger. The total addressable market just for the stash can is over 20 million. The products out there in production now, it's on the market. It's got features that nobody else have at a com very competitive price point. Between myself and three of my most senior guys, we've got 120 years of experience and we've raised over a million dollars to date for the company. Okay, in terms of the business model, the Gen 2 Secure Med Manager has a hardware business model by selling the hardware. It also has a SaaS subscription business model, software as a service, as well as once we get a couple hundred thousand subscribers, there's an enormous amount of value to the compliance data that is stored in the cloud about people taking their meds. And then of course, we've got the IP protection in place for our, for our technology. Thank Last you, Justin. Yeah. Uh, we'll end on, the, on this slide here. Judges, do you have any questions for Justin? Justin, while we're waiting for a question, you want to just quickly uh, walk us through that slide? Sure, would love to. This is our regulation crowdfunding, a convertible note offering. This is a summary of it that's all out there on the WeFunder site. We're looking to raise the, the maximum, which is a million seventy, eight percent annual rate, 7% valuation cap, 15% discount, 18-month uh, option with an extension for another six months after that. The minimum investment being a regulation crowdfund is relatively low. It's about $250. We also on the side have a Reg D 
that we can stand up within 24 hours for anybody that comes in as an accredited investor with 25,000 or more. Excellent. Investor judges. Very, very interesting, Justin. Uh, I, I, I particularly started really perking up when you mentioned the opioid addiction solution and uh, just the dispensing of the medicine. It kind of hits me uh, close to home. Not that I'm, uh, my wife worked uh, as a nurse at an uh, opioid addiction clinic they, where they have 400 patients standing outside every day. And on Fridays, they have to issue their meds for the weekends. Right. And this is a great solution for things like that to where you can be able to monitor how much they're getting. Um, and so that, I saw that as being really great. There's, there's, there's more than one of those clinics here in Las Vegas. They're just all over the place. Well, so imagine I, if I could, if I could add to that, uh, my guess is within five years, if you go to a, if you go to a pharmacist and you get a controlled substance prescription, something like opioids, Ambien, Adderall, it's going to be in a device with this kind of technology in it. This is very low cost, 10 to $15 a month subscription fee. That's yep. where we're headed. This is the dispensing medium of the future. What are you seeing as, uh, you know, any challenges of having that? Is there any challenges with the FDA or, or anything like that with having a device like this? Great, great question. That's why that lawyer that's uh, an investor and advisor, we vetted our FDA registration process with him. We do not have to have an FDA approval. Thank God, that's complicated. We have a 501k uh, uh, exempt class one, which is a, the second simplest thing you can possibly do with the FDA. Not that anything is simple with the FDA, but it's the second simplest thing you can do. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Justin, from our chat room, we have a question. Uh, a couple of folks seem to think that there are other uh, similar products that are available. Um, how do you compete and win against other technologies that may be available? Yeah, that's a great question. And there are some competitors out there. One of the key things, though, is uh, the one, there's one competitor that's a little bit ahead of us, and they dispense a single pill. It's about the size of a pack of cigarettes, and we've got that featured. You can see it in our investor pack on the WeFunder site. They, they put out one kind of pill. What we dispense is a thing here called pill packs. This is basically a roll of, of pills on a perforations between each one of them, so you can have multiple controlled substances dispensed from our machine. The bottom line is the 20 million American vets that have chronic pain, the vast majority of them don't take just an opioid as a controlled substance. They're taking Ambien, they're taking antidepressants, they're taking anti-anxiety pills. And the only way you can do that is in a pill pack form and we're the only one doing pill packs. And what's it made from? Can it be broken into with a screwdriver? Another question from our chat room. Great, great, great question. That's this guy right here. And oh, you can see, there is no doubt that you could pick it up and take a buzzsaw to it and get it open. The thing about it is it's always connected to the cloud. Okay, and as soon as, as, soon as it's, uh, the, it's got tamper sensors in it, it shuts down, notifies the cloud, and the most they're gonna get is whatever supply of pills is in it. So the way it would work for the VA, for example, for, the, uh, for the, all the vets with chronic pain is every month they go back to the VA or back to their pharmacy, pharmacy loads up a 30 day supply of opioids in this dispenser for them and they take it away. 30 days later, they come back and exchange it. Wonderful. For a company that seems like they've thought of everything, you've got 45 seconds. Is there anything else you'd like the, this audience to know about you and your opportunity? Well, yeah, I guess the, I uh, didn't get too much, talk too much about the stash can. We're out there on, we're on Amazon. We're on our own website, direct to consumer. And we're also on Sharper Image. Sharper Image has just suddenly, they've given us a couple of POs here in the last couple of weeks. They are suddenly jumping out of their seats to, uh, to get the stash can. So that was, that was great news. Yeah, it is. And it looks like another company has brought a robust uh, group to, for an active chat. Uh, a lot of fans over there. So right. congratulations, Justin. Well done. Very much appreciate it. Look forward to seeing what the judges think. Sure thing. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right. Last but very not least, we bring back a veteran here to our pitch contest. Welcome St Skip Stone, the CEO of Stash Logics. Skip, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Take her away. All right. Let me uh, grab my presentation. And first, I'd like to say um, thanks, Jim, for hosting this. And uh, been a lot of great 
presentations. And Justin, I uh, love what you're doing. We're doing something very similar, but more in a lifestyle brand play. So um, I'm Skip Stone, founder and CEO of Stash Logics. We make the best stash bags in the world. They are thoughtful, secure, and discreet. Thoughtful because we include features that no one else thought of, secure because our patented bags have a lock to keep kids safe, and discreet because we seal in the odors with special zippers, gaskets, and liners. And they're specifically designed to not look like a stoner product either. That's because we're targeting the new cannabis consumer. That's the business people, the athletes, baby boomers, soccer moms. Uh, that's where we see the real opportunity. And related to the hemp industry, uh, a lot of our products are made with hemp. So a lot of the products you see here are hemp fat, uh, fiber based products. So anyway, um, speaking of opportunity, we're raising a million dollars at a $5 million valuation. It is a series A uh, round, equity round. We have 690,000 of this round raised. So we have 310 left to go. So let's dive into what investors want to know about. I'm going to quickly run through the problem, the market, competition, traction, our financial model, the exit, and the team. So first, the problem. Keeping kids safe from edibles has always been a driving force for us. Edibles need to be locked up around kids, end of story. But historically, cannabis storage has focused on padding. Uh, cannabis is much more than glass pipes. Cannabis is dirty and smelly and sticky. But it's also beautiful and fragile and powerful, and it's not for everybody. So Stash Logics was created to address all of these challenges, whether it's a road trip to visit the in-laws for the holidays and you want to bring your cannabis, or it's a camping trip with family and friends, or just a night on the town, Stash Logics has you covered. And it turns out you're not alone. There are actually 220 uh, million worldwide cannabis consumers, and a recent Maris poll showed that 50% of them are parents, and these numbers are expected to double in the next 10 years. So we have a niche and a massive market. How are we going to compete? Well, we already have competition. It's dime bags, uh, skunk bags, and riot bags. And however, they're targeting the stoner demographic, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just we see the real opportunity is to skate to where the puck is going, not where it is. Uh, so we're, we're, our brand is talking to the parents, empowered women, uh, business professionals, athletes, and people love the outdoors. People like us. We're a Boulder, Colorado company. People relate to our lifestyle brand because it's aspirational and it's authentic. And it's working. We've now sold $3.3 million worth of weed bags and we don't even include the weed. It's supposed to be a joke, but it's true. We've sold $3.3 million starting in my garage a little, a little over four years ago. So. Um, we're getting good at this and it's, and it's working. And as a result, we're now cash flow positive. We're running 60% gross margins this year. Uh, and we've done this all on just $590,000 of invested capital. We get ROI. And our brand is really starting to grow, to build online. Uh, in fact, three out of the last four months have been our best online sales months to date. And if we can thrive during a pandemic, then there's really not, not a lot that can stop us. Um, at the rate we're growing, we expect uh, pan, um, exits to happen sooner rather than later. Uh, seeing that we have an early connection to this new cannabis consumer, we think we're gonna be prime acquisition for, prime target for an acquisition. Uh, we're gonna be acquired by whoever values brand. Um, we're gonna, and they wanna partner with the best. So the team that's going to deliver that exit is myself, I'm an engineer. I founded the company to address my own needs with two young kids in the house in Colorado, newly legalizing cannabis. Um, I designed a prototype of a locking uh, cannabis bag, an order proof bag, and uh, in, enrolled for the first class of Canopy Boulder, a business accelerator, first of its kind for cannabis specific businesses. There I met my lead mentor, Steve Norman. Steve is a serial entrepreneur, uh, most notable of which was he co-founded and was the first COO for Einstein Bagels. So he knows how to run complicated businesses and how to scale up. Uh, after Excuse Canopy five ended, minutes, 60 seconds left. After Canopy ended, um, Steve joined the team 
full time. He was our first investor and has been in the trenches with us every day. Blair has an MBA and she keeps the trains running on time. And Isaac is our young gun marketing guru who knows how to pull the right levers to build our brand online. So with that, I think we've ticked off all the investor boxes, all our ducks are in a row, we're ready to scale. We have $310,000 left to close the round. With this capital, we're gonna be putting it into online marketing where we see uh, $4 of revenue for every dollar of ad spend. Um, and we're gonna be firing up our distribution channel, which has been very successful for us in the past. All of this is going to further our mission of normalizing cannabis, of breaking the stigma, and we're doing that by just helping people organize, store, travel with cannabis uh, so they can avoid the life of judgment that all cannabis consumers uh, have to deal with. So um, with that, um, please go to our website, stashlogics.com, check out our innovative line of products, and that'll take any questions from investors. Skip, well done. Within seconds of your six minutes, I, first question, I'll turn it over to the other uh, investor judges, but... Uh, this isn't your first time here. Have you raised any money since last time we saw you? I have a good couple quest, uh, couple investors that were interested, some of the investor judges. So we're, we're in conversation. The last pitch was probably three weeks ago. So as you know, it's kind of hard to finalize things that quickly. But we do have, uh, in a couple weeks, our lead will be coming in for 400000 And we're trying to close it with that last 300000 So some good conversations going Um yeah, I think our valuation is extremely low for, for what, what we've accomplished in a short period of time. Excellent. Thank you for the strong finish. Judges, any questions for Skip? Skip, you talked about valuation. What, did I miss? I thought you were, was it raising a convertible note? It's a Series A um, equity oh. round, uh, yeah. $5 million valuation. Okay. Skip, what's you your, mentioned one of your exits is to uh, what's get your, rolled up by another company that values brand. Uh, any thoughts where that might come from? Are you having discussions with, with that uh, opportunity? Uh, with, with exits and other brands? Yeah. You know, we see the exits could come from a lot of different uh, channels. It could be a distributor that we have that may be interested in purchasing us. That happens a lot. Um, what we really are, are kind of striving for more so is to capture an outside lifestyle brand, bag brand, apparel brand that wants to get into the cannabis industry. We have all the distribution, industry presence, industry credibility. Um, so that's kind of what we're gearing up to. We haven't had a lot of those conversations because we have a lot more to accomplish yet. We've done most, we've done everything in just a little over $500,000 of investment. So um, to date, we, there's a lot more to accomplish. Good answer. Judges. Skip, what was your year to date? You're, you've done 3.3 million in sales thus far. How much of that for this year and how much of that last year? Yeah, so we've had, we had a, a strong year a couple of years ago. We sold 1.2 million. Um, a lot of that was through a, um, to, through a distributor in Canada, uh, one of the best distributors up there. So we have a huge presence in Canada. Uh, Canada has been a challenge and has slowed way down. So that distributor has not been firing for us for the last two years. So our, we've had to change our model up. So now we're mostly online. So we've switched from being primarily distributor to primarily online. So now we're at about 80% online, 15% uh, to wholesale and 5%, uh, yeah, 5% to distributor. So that's kind of our um, um, blend right now. And uh, we think distribute. Dis so that's a question I have for some of the judges is what do you feel is more valuable, um, an online revenue or dis distribution revenue? I think both accomplish something really important, but our focus, we really like this online play. It's a bit more scalable in our eyes. So we, and to answer your credit, we our question, we've sold about 600,000 so far this year. Yeah, Skip, if, if, if you're already profitable um, and, and you're seeing $4 in revenue for every $1 in ad spend, um, that's pretty interesting. What, what are the margins um, in the business? Well, we're 60% this year. Uh, to date, uh, throughout inception, I think we're about 55%. So we've held strong margins. This year, it's been better because it's been online. 
However, we have been offering some sales through the pandemic. We weren't sure how things were going to go, and, um, but we've actually been thriving. So, um, yeah, we're, we've got some products that we hit at 90%. Other products were hitting it on a retail channel. Um, others were hitting more like the 70%, but pretty strong margins. Yeah, with those kind of margins, if you're seeing $4 for every dollar in ad spend, that, that seems like a pretty scalable business pretty quickly if you can get to those customers. Um, yeah. I like the model. Nice job. Thanks. Yeah, I, I agree. Our dilemma here, because it doesn't make sense to raise money with those numbers, but we're right at this break-even point where salaries, inventory, and marketing are all competing for each other um, for, our, for our capital. So more capital will allow us to really scale this. So. I like the online margins, but I also like the uh, brand awareness that can be generated via the in-store. Um, so you've got about uh, 50 seconds left. Is there anything that you wanted to make sure that the audience was aware of? Anything you're proud of? Or uh, why don't you round us out with some great commentary? Uh, we have a lot more to talk about. We've talk I've talked mostly about our cannabis angle. We have other things going on right now through channel through other channels, um, travel and also opioid stuff as well. So that's interesting. Um, I guess I'd love to reach out and talk to anybody that has interest. I think we've accomplished, everything we've done has been in-house from graphic design to all sorts of pro um, custom programming for running our business. A lot of interesting things going on. I'd love to talk about it more. Excellent, Skip. Very much appreciate uh, you being here. Uh, another job well done. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Well, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for all of the presenters and judges for helping me air traffic control and keep us on time here. We've come to the point in our, uh, in our uh, investor pitch contest where it's time for the voting. This is the time where the judges will indicate who has carried their favor and give us some uh, feedback and opinion on why they chose those uh, opportunities. And on your screen, uh, you should be able to see uh, for our audience an opportunity to vote for each of the eight presentations. Who was it? Who captured your fascination? Who do you think is an opportunity to warrant investment dollars in a very capital constricted market? I heard eight solid pitches today. I uh, very interested in the first one and I really think that they did a nice job in holding my attention throughout and I hope that you feel the same way. But was there anyone that really stood out? Is there anyone who nailed it in your mind? Was able to dimensionalize the opportunity and demonstrate how they would capitalize on it? That their raise made sense to you? That their valuations were in a, a range that would appeal to you? Uh, if, if so, there's the opportunity for you to vote. And with that, I'd like to go uh, back to the judges. I wanted to let the audience and other judges know that two judges did have to uh, leave us here towards the end. They did reach out and communicate who they would be voting for. Um, but I guess let's take it in, all, in, uh, in order that we introduced everybody. Chris with Kaliba, what are your thoughts? Um, I am literally going back through all my notes. Um, <laughs> But uh, a, a couple stand, stand out. So before I click the box, I'm going to talk out loud a little bit. I um, think you give it, just so you know, the judges give it verbally. I'll tally it up and give the judges that vote is for the audience. Oh, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's what it says down there in red. Uh, panelists can't vote. Got it. Yeah, I, I, I thought uh, uh, Gravitas was very interesting. Um, I, I love the idea of converting plastic um, seems like there's a great environmental angle. Um, I, I wish there was a little bit more time on, on that presentation. That was definitely one of my, one of my top three. Um, I thought that uh, Veed was also very interesting. Um, I think uh, at Kaliba, we're looking at a, a lot of ways to market the products and, and affiliate programs. So I think that the idea of turning a customer into a seller uh, it is interesting and, and I think very timely. So that would certainly be in, in one of my top three. And then um, I, I really enjoyed the last two presentations. Um, I, I think the lock brands with the stash can uh, and the data, um, uh, the ability to collect data around the secure med manager is interesting. Although I don't know much about that space, 
but uh, I thought Justin gave a, a great presentation. Um, I think in terms of nailing the presentation, uh, if I had to put one up there that I see as, as an immediate uh, kind of CPG product that has an immediate solution, uh, I, I think I would, I would use Lock Brands uh, as my number one at the top, just based on my understanding of, uh, of the presentation in a limited, uh, in a limited time. Excellent. Wonderful synopsis. All right. Tom Lazat, do you have a chance to articulate your vote or um, was that yeah, just an indication? Sure. Yes, I did indicate my vote. My vote went to uh, Lock Brands with uh, Stash Can. Uh, I think, it, you know, I was really, you know, there were four presentations, though, that, that really caught my attention. Um, you know, and early on, Fino did a really good job as far as being very likable. Um, there are people that I feel like I could trust my money with. I just don't think they have a big enough market and, and scalability of what they want to do right now. Um, it's just going to be a much slower process of growing that type of business. So as an investor, you're obviously looking at, you know, the payout. So that that there was, you know, a challenge for me. Um, I liked Veed as well, um, you know, turning a customer into a seller. Uh, that's, that's something that uh, we, we need to do because there's, there's not a lot of brand loyalty um, that exists today. Uh, I, I think that, you know, we still need to grow in the industry for brand loyalty. So I, I did like that. Um, I, I didn't understand a few of the things that were going on. So I think that that's why I didn't go there. And between the last two, they were very interesting. I like the traction that Stash, Stash Logic has. I really like uh, where you're going and, and um, your exit strategy. And I feel like you checked all the boxes that needed to be checked as far as presenting to an investor. Um, you definitely gave us a problem, a solution, the market, the team, the go-to-market strategy, and the traction. You, you nailed it on that. And I, I just look at um, what, what uh, you know, is that something that could just be easily duplicated? That's where I looked at that. So as far as that, where Stash Can and, and Lock Brands is right now, I felt like that was you know, it's, it's harder to duplicate. It's um, the data. I like the data collection. I liked it for solving something else besides hemp. So that I know that was a long winded answer, but that, that's how I can. Oh, good stuff. I, I bet they all appreciate the, uh, the feedback. Thank you very much. Um, so Jay or John, do you have an opportunity to uh, come to a conclusion? Want to share your thoughts? Sure. Let me preface by saying, the biggest mistake I ever made investing in the cannabis sector was, or hemp for that matter, was not fully understanding the regulatory risk. I grossly underestimated that. In my prior life, I applied for licenses for cell phones and for internet spectrum and so forth and thought I had a handle on this stuff. Well, compared to that, <laughs> this space is a lot more challenging. So I'm kind of stuck on simplicity now. I like Skip's product. I just don't see any regulatory risk around it. Obviously, there's concerns about duplication and so forth, right? But bottom line is you can roll this thing out online and you don't have to worry about somebody from the FDA or God knows where else, some other organization uh, giving you a hard time. So that's where my vote's with him on that one. As for the rest of you, I'm just, I'm sorry if it's too short of a period of time for me to fully assess the risks, but I definitely see some good entrepreneurs here and I wish you all well. And I mean that in every spirit of this, every sense of the word, because I've been an entrepreneur and I know what it's like. I've been, I've had to raise capital many times and I know what it's like to be on that side. So I empathize with you. Just persist. Outstanding feedback. Jay, are you still with us? Thank you. I am, and I particularly liked uh, Fino Ag. I can totally relate to the whole um, analogy of co-locating. I came out of that background. I think there's a lot of people out there who would view it as niche, yet, um, Tim, to your point, is it scalable? Yeah, I think over the long haul, because I think there will be entrepreneurs who kind of seize upon the idea of co-locating and having someone else kind of do some of the dirty work 
is an entry point for them. Now, whether that's maybe some applicants who applied for craft grow that didn't get that tap on the shoulder, maybe it's those educators that are building out programs that want to start growing small stale uh, kind of farms or plots using your technology. So I like it. I think you're answering a question that's maybe not the large question that's out there, but you're filling a, a small void. Uh, and I particularly like Element Apothic. I think, Davina, what you're doing there with the focus on education, education, education is going to uh, bring, your, bring your product across the goal line. The inclusion of the other cannabinoids in the product, I think, are something that you could highlight, focus, and even take to a next level based around CBG and CBN itself. I loved your management team. It contains family. It's diverse. Uh, and the simplicity of your presentation and the, the marketing of the product brand itself, I think it was very appealing. Outstanding. And I do have, unfortunately, Scott Griper uh, was able to join us, but was not able to uh, stay through the end. He wanted to let uh, the audience know that his pick was Gravitas Cannabis. And his reason was he likes their mission, the amount of capital they've raised, and their deep engineering expertise. Also, Jeff Finkel had to um, skedaddle. Before leaving, he cast his vote for Fino. So in all of our preparing and, and role playing and first, We've shared the vote, uh, shared the results. What a tight race. So in that, it looks like our audience by a hair voted Stash Logics as the winner once again here for the pitch contest. Congratulations to Stash Logics. Everyone received a vote who is very close uh, with Gravitas and Fino. Uh, just just behind stash logics what's interesting is our investor judges mirror the audience and in all of our preparation and uh, hopefully you guys really enjoyed this i know i did it went off with uh, very few issues if any and we didn't cover what happens if there's a tie so we have a tie between Fino and Lockbrains. So unless any of the other moderators or Brad has anything else, I'm about to declare two brands, two presentations to be the winners. Going once, going twice. Congratulations to Fino. Congratulations to Lockbrains. You are the winner of the Hemp Opportunities Pitch Contest. Congratulations to all. I know that Brad will be following up with you with some wonderful marketing materials so that you can make this day live on. In closing, I wanted to thank the investor judges and the presenting companies, and especially you, the audience, for joining us today. We would like to remind the audience and the investor judges that you can watch recordings of today's presentations seen today on the Cannabis Investing Forum website and YouTube. For those that would like to contact the presenters and investor judges, their email is available online. And please, oh, hang on. And please make sure to mark your calendars for our next investor event, the Investor Hot Seat on October 29th, and the Cannabis Investing Forum Las Vegas live event and webinar on December 10th, 11th, and 12th. We are seeking companies that would like to present, investor judges, and media, marketing, uh, and marketing partners. You will find the information at the cannabisinvestingforum.com and register on Eventbrite.